yeah, did anyone purchase? Oh, shoot, never mind. Sure. Hello. Yes, I assume you guys can hear me. Yeah. OK, great. All right, any questions before we begin? Not let me uh, share my screen. Let me state that I've got some grading done. I think I mentioned last time that I had lab three and lab four graded uh, for the first time. And so if you want to make corrections for those two labs, lab three and lab four, you need to have the corrections in by this Saturday, August 5th. <clears throat> Sorry, I got a frog in my throat. I'm still working on lab five. So I will extend the due date on that lab. Um, I'm not going to change that now, but uh, it says that the second grading's got to be due by August 5th, and I'm going to extend that because I haven't got the first grading done. Any questions about any of that? Am I sharing my screen? Looks like it. Yeah, you are. Yeah, okay, you are. Um, let's go ahead and close that. Well, no, I should go home. Let me remind you, you need to turn in a, uh, a project for your infectious disease project. And you should be working on that. <clears throat> I don't remember when that's due. Let me look at the schedule here. The infectious disease project is due Saturday, August 19th. You should also uh, be thinking about the unknown projects. I haven't sent out the results, and I think I don't send out the results until next Tuesday for the first three tests. But they are started, or they will be started. I think the gram stain doesn't start until this Sunday and the PR lactose doesn't start until Monday, but I'll send you the results on Tuesday. Uh, if you're confused about the unknown project, send me an email and I'll try and get it straightened out. And anytime during the term, if you get confused on the unknown project, please send me an email. Any questions about any of that? All right, today is all. I have a question. Sorry. So for my for my um project, which project? The back the, the report on the bacteria I chose. I'm missing like a hundred pages out of the textbook. Sorry. For this semester, I'm missing like a hundred pages out of the book, and my infectious disease happens to be in one of those missing pages. What so I don't have pages from 290 to 359. It? What chapter is it? Uh, I believe 11 and 12. 11 and 12. Yeah, we're not covering those two chapters. So they're not in the, right. the uh, version the of the textbook for uh, uh, Clark College. Right. Okay, um, that's weird. Okay. Yeah, so you'll have to look it up uh, on the internet or um, Berge's manual. I okay. wouldn't think your Thank textbook you. would be that good of a reference for yeah. the unknown project anyways. Okay. It's just weird because it's in the index, but then the pages aren't there. I've never had to buy a book like that before. Okay. Yeah, Thank it's you. because that we have a, uh, what do they call that? A, a, a textbook made for Clark College, and it only has the chapters in it that we cover. I think gotcha. chapter nine is in there because one instructor who teaches microbiology covers that chapter, but the rest of us don't. Okay, thank you. All right. All right, so today is August 3rd, uh, 3rd and we're supposed to be uh, finishing chapter five and actually starting chapter six. I don't think we'll start chapter six 
but we're going to try and finish chapter five, microbial metabolism. We are going to have a lab today at the lab time, which I think is seven o'clock in the summer. Any question about what we're covering? All right, if not, let's begin. So we had discussed that up there, uh, this slide where we were taking a look at the nutritional classification of organisms and how you should, oh crud, I can't get in there to get that deleted. Uh, you should know the uh, area marked in red. So when we're talking about energy production, you should realize that nutrient molecules have energy associated with the electrons that form their chemical bonds in the molecule. In cells, energy is obtained from catabolic reactions and it's stored in the bonds of ATP. Now in our cells, we do break down the chemical bonds of glucose and essentially any food molecule we eat. And then we harvest that energy and store that energy in the bonds of ATP. ATP is an energy carrier of cells. It has a high energy bond, which is also an unstable bond. And the energy can be released quickly and easily. And generally when cells need energy, they will take it from ATP. And what they do is they break down ATP to release the energy uh, from that third phosphate bond. Any questions about any of that? When we're talking about energy production, you should realize that energy production comes about through oxidation reduction reactions. Oxidation is where a molecule or atom loses an electron. So A loses an electron, and we say A is oxidized. B gains the electron, and B becomes reduced because reduction is the gain of an electron. Oxidation reduction reactions are always coupled, meaning one molecule or atom loses an electron, another molecule or atom gains the electron. Oxidation reduction reactions is a bit of a mouthful. And so people have a shorthand for saying that and they call it a redox reaction. So redox reaction means the same as oxidation reduction reactions. Here is an actual example where we have copper plus one gets together with iron plus three, and then oxidation reduction reaction occurs where the copper becomes oxidized, losing an electron, becoming copper plus two, and the iron plus three gains an electron, becoming iron plus two. Any question about any of that? Now here's a, a mnemonic for remembering oxidation reduction reactions. And you can say, Leo, the lion goes grr. Leo, lose an electron, oxidation. Grr, gain an electron, reduction. So Leo the lion goes grr. Any question about that? And Leo stands for lose electron oxidation. Grr stands for gain electron reduction. Any question about any of that? <clears throat> oxidation in biological systems usually has a proton, meaning a hydrogen ion, hydrogen plus one, usually being removed with the electron. And the hydrogen ion usually follows the electron. Remember that hydrogen ion plus an electron equals the hydrogen atom. 
So in biological oxidations, are often called dehydrogenations because they also lose a, a uh, hydrogen ion. So here, let me blow that up and get to it. We have a molecule and it's gonna lose an electron so it's going to become oxidized. It also loses a hydrogen ion. And then NAD plus gains the electron. Come on. It also gains the hydrogen ion and is uh, reduced and becomes uh, NADH with a hydrogen ion and an electron. Actually, NAD uh, plus gains two electrons and one hydrogen. And the other hydrogen just becomes hydrogen ion in solution. You don't need to know that, but just to be balanced. Any questions about that? So that's something we see in biological reactions. So biological redox reactions are used in catabolism to extract energy from nutrient molecules. Highly reduced compounds, meaning molecules with a lot of hydrogen ions are degraded, catabolized to highly oxidized compounds. An example would be glucose, C6H12O6, which is a highly reduced compound, has lots of hydrogen, will become oxidized to CO2 and water. The energy that's released from glucose will be, much of it, not all of it, but a lot of it will be trapped in the energy stored in ATP. So that energy will be used from the breakdown of glucose to make ATP. And then I should mention that the highly reduced compounds like glucose contain a large amount of energy and that's potential energy stored in the chemical bonds of that molecule. And when we break those chemical bonds, we release that energy. Any question about any of that? All right, let's move on to aerobic respiration then. Aerobic respiration is how our cells convert energy from glucose to ATP. And this is called aerobic respiration. It's also called cellular respiration. If you do use the term cellular respiration, just realize that it means aerobic respiration because there are other cells, other than our cells, that perform respiration, and it's not aerobic respiration. But when we use the term cellular respiration, we mean aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration changes glucose and oxygen, shown here, or right here, and uh, takes in ADP and inorganic phosphate, and then cellular respiration occurs to make ATP and the glucose and the oxygen are converted into CO2 and water and the ADP and the phosphate are converted into ATP. Any question about any of that? This is only the summary reaction for aerobic respiration. So what we start with glucose and oxygen, what we end with, carbon dioxide and water, as well as ATP. This happens in a large number of steps, and we'll talk about the steps of aerobic respiration in just a little bit. The energy production is used to generate ATP. In our cells, some of the energy from some redox reactions 
is used by the cell to make ATP. And I'm saying only some redox reactions make ATP. Our cells are really poor at making ATP. We only have two reactions that can make ATP. And the first I've already shown you, aerobic respiration. And then the second we'll talk about a little bit later, it is fermentation. Both of those molecules tend to use a molecule like glucose and then break it down to make the ATP. ATP is generated by the phosphorylation of ADP. Phosphorylation is just the addition of a phosphate group to the molecule. So we have ADP and we have energy and then a phosphate group, that's an inorganic phosphate group, makes ATP. The ATP has two bonds, which are high energy bonds, the third phosphate and the second phosphate. If the cell wants energy, it frequently breaks this high energy bond right here and that then reduces or gives off a lot of energy. And then the cell can use that energy for its energy needs. If the cell needs further energy, it could even break this high energy bond. Come on, my mouse is dead. There we go. You can break that energy bond. And that also reduces, gives off a lot of energy. <clears throat> Norm <clears throat> normally a cell, will just break off the uh, third phosphate, meaning just break this bond because they have a lot of ATP in them. And whenever it needs more energy, it'll just break another ATP. Cells have three mechanisms for making ATP. There's substrate level phosphorylation, which is the transfer of a high energy phosphate molecule in a molecule from one molecule, this molecule, to ADP, meaning CCP plus ADP makes CCC with the phosphate gone. And then the phosphate moves to ADP to make ATP. So the phosphate is directly moved and added to ADP. This actually happens in fermentation and glycolysis, and we'll talk about glycolysis in just a little bit. Fermentation we'll also talk about today, but it'll be later today. Any question about the generation of ATP? All right, this is the first way that cells can make ATP. The second way they can make ATP is by respiration. It is also called oxidative phosphorylation, but I don't use that term. Your textbook doesn't either. Respiration involves the sequential transfer of electrons from an electron donor molecule to the final electron acceptor, meaning the last molecule to accept the electron. In aerobic respiration, electrons are donated by glucose and then they're accepted by these molecules shown here, NADH or FADH2, which then go through all of these molecules. I'm not going to name them all. And the electron is passed from one molecule, and then it's uh, this molecule becomes uh, reduced, gaining the electron, and then it oxidizes, giving the electron to this molecule, etc. So the Electron moves from this molecule to that 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 molecule. And then aerobic respiration, the oxygen, uh, the electron leaves this last molecule and then goes to oxygen. So oxygen is said to be the final electron acceptor in aerobic respiration. All of these other molecules are uh, electron carriers, and they are actually the electron carriers of the electron transport chain, 
that we'll talk about in a few minutes. And the point is, is that the electron is losing its energy in uh, each transfer. So the electron is losing its energy slowly. So the electron is not, uh, or the energy is not reduced or is not given off all at once. So the energy is given off in a controlled sequence. And that's why when you burn a cup of sugar or glucose, you'd have to take a blowtorch to it and then the, the glucose would catch fire and it gives so much energy that I being right here to the glucose would have to step way back because it would give off so much energy because that's because the energy is being released all at once. In our cells, the energy goes through this electron transport chain and that re, um, controls the release of the energy. And so when the energy is given off, it is not going to raise the temperature to a thousand degrees. Your cell will stay at 37 degrees. Any question about uh, respiration, the second way that we can generate ATP? Now note, I've talked about aerobic respiration, but here I've said respiration. This includes all forms of respiration, aerobic respiration and anaerobic forms of respiration. They all happen by the sequential transfer of electrons from a donor molecule such as glucose, and usually by NADH, and then some of these molecules here in the electron transport chain. They do not flow to oxygen in anaerobic respiration, and we'll talk about that later. The third way that energy can be used to make ATP is by photophosphorylation. Photophosphorylation only occurs in photosynthetic cells. Light energy releases electrons from chlorophyll, and then that light energy is converted to chemical energy via an electron transport chain. And ATP and NADPH are generated, but they are often used to make sugar. So usually in photosynthesis, we say that the energy in light is converted to the energy of sugar. Any question about that? And here you're seeing a bunch of organisms which are undergoing photophosphorylation. Any questions? That's why the boys are so muddy. They're engaging in photophosphorylation. That's a joke, by the way. Metabolic pathways of energy production. Energy is released from molecules in controlled ways and stored by a series of reaction. It doesn't happen in a single energy burst. Electrons from the donor molecules are passed from one compound to another through a series of redox reactions. And this is the redox reaction of aerobic respiration. You don't have to memorize this, by the way. I'm just showing it to you. Most organisms can use carbohydrate catabolism to make ATP. And their primary source for cellular energy is usually glucose, the most common energy source. So they broke down, break down glucose to make ATP. And that's true for us, as well as most other living organisms. They may, like we may, digest lipids and proteins and other carbohydrates. But if you're a couch potato, like I am, I usually when we break down carbohydrates, we'll just break it down into glucose 
or convert the other sugars into glucose, and then send glucose through the normal way of aerobic respiration. And then for couch potatoes, you also break down lipids, but you convert them into glucose as well as proteins, and then send glucose down aerobic respiration. That doesn't happen for Olympic athletes and athletes that are very strenuously exercising or for marathon runners. They can break down lipids and proteins directly and then convert the lipid into ATP or the protein into ATP. With lipids, a marathon runner has to be running for 45 minutes before their body will start breaking down lipids. Before that, their body is breaking down glucose and other carbohydrates. And it's not until all of those are used up that the body will start to break down lipids and will actually burn lipids directly to make ATP. Now, like I said, if you're a couch potato, you probably convert the lipid into glucose and then send glucose through the aerobic respiration steps to make ATP. To produce energy from glucose, microorganisms have two general processes to make ATP. There's respiration, which I've already talked about. And let me state that there are two forms of respiration, aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. The other process that organisms may use to make ATP is fermentation. And our cells can use aerobic respiration to make energy. They do not use anaerobic respiration. That's something that anaerobes do. We are an aerobe, so we do not perform anaerobic respiration. But some of our cells can perform fermentation. Does anybody know what of our, which of our cells can perform fermentation? Come on, I'm sure somebody knows. When you're exercising a lot, what burns? What feels like, what tissue is burning? What? Don't muscles, muscles. do yeah, your muscles. Your muscle cells can perform fermentation. And they only do that when oxygen becomes limiting in the muscle. Okay. Any question about any of that? If not, artificial let's watch intelligence, a video but also allows you to do things like on aerobic respiration. One-click buttons to rewrite sentences. After it the pops commercial. up as a. All cells need energy to stay alive. Usually your cells get their energy through the process called aerobic respiration. The word aerobic refers to oxygen. In aerobic respiration, oxygen interacts chemically with a molecule of glucose. The glucose is broken down into carbon dioxide and water. This process releases energy, which the cell stores in the chemical bonds of ATP. The first stage of aerobic respiration, glycolysis, occurs in the cytosol, the jelly-like part of the cytoplasm. Glycolysis breaks each molecule of glucose into two molecules of pyruvate, energizes two electron carrier molecules, and produces two molecules of ATP. The next two stages of aerobic respiration are carried out in the mitochondria. Pyruvate enters a mitochondrion. Once inside, it is modified and enters the Krebs cycle. The reactions of the Krebs cycle break the pyruvate molecules down to carbon dioxide, create two more molecules of ATP, 
and energize more electron carrier molecules. The final stage of aerobic respiration is electron transport. The electron carrier molecules that were energized in the earlier stages deliver electrons and hydrogen ions to the electron transport chain. As the electrons are passed down the chain, energy is released and used to make ATP. This final stage produces as many as 32 molecules of ATP from each molecule of glucose. All right, any question about that? So let's talk about aerobic respiration. Here we're looking at an overview of aerobic respiration on the left and fermentation on the right. Aerobic respiration has three principal stages. Let me see if I can blow this up. Aerobic respiration has glycolysis, shown here, the Krebs cycle, shown here, and that's actually the preparatory step and the Krebs cycle. And then the electron transport chain, shown here. The three principal steps of aerobic respiration. Essentially, electrons flow from glucose, the starting molecule, which is an energy-rich molecule, to CO2 and water, which are energy poor molecules. And uh, let's see, yeah, I guess the electron does uh, come into water. It does yield a high yield of ATP. We get 36 to 38 ATP molecules per molecule of glucose, a high yield. Fermentation involves glycolysis only. And then there's no Krebs cycle or no electron transport chain. Instead, we have uh, a fermentation step or steps. Usually it's just one or two reactions. And pyruvate is converted. Uh, we'll talk about pyruvate. It's the end product of glycolysis. is converted into the product of fermentation, which is often ethanol or lactic acid. A much lower yield of ATP, you only get two ATP molecules per molecule of glucose from fermentation. This is showing you an overview of aerobic respiration in a eukaryotic cell. If you take the pink square as a cell, you can see that aerobic respiration happens inside the cell, obviously. It starts with glycolysis, which happens in the cytoplasm of the cell. In glycolysis, glucose is converted into pyruvate, also called pyruvic acid. I'll talk a little bit more about that. We do generate a little bit of ATP, and we generate NADH. I'll talk about the NADH later. The pyruvate then enters in a eukaryotic cell, enters the mitochondria, and the pyruvate will enter the preparatory step in the citric acid cycle. That does generate a little bit of ATP. The, um, the preparatory step and the Krebs cycle convert the glucose into CO2, shown here. Like I said, that's happening inside the mitochondria. And then the uh, citric acid cycle generates NADH and FADH2. And remember, glycolysis did in, in generate some F NADH. These molecules carry the electrons to the third stage of aerobic respiration, which I'm going to call the electron transport chain. It's also called electron transport phosphorylation, which is a same, similar enough name that doesn't confuse students. It's also called chemoosmosis, 
and oxidative phosphorylation. I don't use these terms. And your textbook hardly uses those terms. It tends to use electron transport chain, same term as I use. So the electrons are carried to the electron transport chain and then ATP production kicks into high gear where we make a lot of ATP. The electron transport chain occurs um, in the inner mitochondrial wall of the mitochondria of a eukaryotic cell. And so this picture is showing you what's happening if you consider the pink here to be the cell. Any question about any of that? Remember that aerobic respiration is also called cellular respiration. And I don't like the term cellular respiration because anaerobic respiration can occur in a cell, but it is not referred to as cellular respiration. So I will use the term aerobic respiration. Any question about any of that? All right, if not, let's talk about glycolysis, the first step in respiration. Glycolysis does have another name. I don't use it, the ebden meyerhoff pathway. And those are named after the doctors who discovered it. Um, your textbook hardly uses that term as well. In glycolysis, uh, glucose is oxidized to pyruvic acid. Remember, Pyruvic acid and pyruvate are used interchangeably. Now, if you're a chemist, there is a difference. Pyruvic acid has the hydrogen attached to it. Pyruvate does not. But the cell treats pyruvate the same as it does pyruvic acid. So for the cell, it doesn't matter which it is. And we're going to use the two chain, uh, terms interchangeably because we're not really chemists. We're studying microbiology. And I think it really depends on the pH of the cell, whether you make pyruvic acid or you make pyruvate from aerobic respiration. You don't need to know that last part, but... Uh... Uh, glycolysis does occur in most living cells. It can occur in the presence of oxygen, but it doesn't use oxygen, so it can occur in the absence of oxygen. Glycolysis does produce some ATP and some NADH. Let me turn my volume down a little. I forgot I turned it up for that movie because it was so quiet. Uh, here we're looking at the steps of glycolysis. And when I was a student, I had to name all of the, what do you call that? Uh, the starting substrate, the, all of the intermediates and all of the, the end product of glycolysis. And I had to know all of the enzymes when I was an undergraduate, I had to memorize all of that. And since I was required to know that, I think it's fair that I can require that of you guys. What do you guys say of that? Nobody objects? We'll go with it. Yeah, yeah. You only right. need to know the summary of glycolysis. You start with glucose. It generates a net gain of two ATP. You do generate two pyruvates or pyruvic acids, whatever term you're using. And then you generate two NADHs. Why I'm saying a net gain of two ATP is we actually get four ATP out of glycolysis. However, glycolysis takes in 2 ATP 
in order for glycolysis to occur. And if you look at that right here, let me blow this up. You don't need to know this, I'm just showing you. Uh, this reaction takes in ATP, this reaction takes in ATP, and then we get out ATP, two ATP here, and then two ATP here. So the net gain of glycolysis is two ATP. Any question about any of that? Uh, I should put in here, you do need to know what's in red. And uh, it does start. You do start, obviously you should know this too. Start with glucose. So you do need to know that. Start with glucose, and then you get a net gain of two ATP, two pyruvates, and two NADHs. I'm going to save this, which is really pointless because I don't have this on the uh, the notes for you. <clears throat> but I'll try and update that. Let me make a note here. Oops, it's all off. All right. Respiration then follows glycolysis. Respiration is the oxidation of molecules releasing electrons from the electron transport chain. We're going to talk about aerobic respiration, where the final electron acceptor is oxygen. But do recall that there's also anaerobic respiration, which many bacteria can perform. In anaerobic respiration, the final electron acceptor is not oxygen. Electrons do flow from glucose, but they do not end up at oxygen. They end up at some other molecule other than oxygen. It could be nitrite, could be nitrate, it could be uh, sulfate. It depends on the form of anaerobic respiration. And then ATP is generated by oxidative phosphorylation. So the pyruvate coming out of glycolysis cannot be used directly by the Krebs cycle. So the pyruvate is changed in the preparatory step into another molecule, which can then join the Krebs cycle. So pyruvic acid is oxidized and decarboxylated. You don't really need to know this step. And coenzyme A is attached to it. And then the pyruvic acid is converted into acetyl coenzyme A. Pyruvic acid is a three carbon molecule. Acetyl coenzyme A is a two carbon molecule. So one carbon is given off as CO2. And that's the first production of CO2 in aerobic respiration. Now note that the preparatory step is going to run two times for each molecule of glucose because, is that shown there? Nope, I got to go up here. From one molecule of glucose, we generate two molecules of pyruvic acid. So the preparatory step will run twice because we have two molecules of pyruvic acid per molecule of glucose. Any question about any of that? All right, the uh, acetyl coenzyme A then enters the Krebs cycle. You should know the Krebs cycle has a 
couple of different names, the tricarboxylic acid, because it has a lot of tricarboxylic acids in it. And that just means uh, uh, six carbon molecules. It's also called the citric acid cycle because um, citric acid is the first molecule made in the Krebs cycle. It's called the Krebs cycle after Dr. Krebs who discovered it. And it's also called the TCA cycle. And TCA is an abbreviation for the tricarboxylic tricarboxylic acid. It's also an abbreviation for the citric acid cycle. So TCA. But we will use the term Krebs cycle. Your textbook tends to use the term Krebs cycle also. So there's the preparatory step. Let me see if I can blow this up. And then we enter the Krebs cycle. Acetyl coenzyme A joins with oxaloacetic acid to form the citric acid. You don't need to know that molecule really. And then citric acid is changed into that molecule. Uh, that molecule is changed into this molecule. This molecule is changed into that molecule. That molecule is changed into that molecule. This molecule is changed into that molecule. This molecule is changed into that molecule. This molecule is changed into that molecule. And look at that. We now ended up where we began with oxaloacetic acid. And that is why this is called the cycle. Because as long as acetyl coenzyme A enters the cycle, this cycle will continue because we're going to end up at the molecule we start with. Any question about any of that? Along the way, this oxaloacetic acid and acetyl coenzyme A give off NADH is made, one here, one there, one there, that's three plus a fourth in the preparatory step. And then FADH2 is made, one here. CO2 is given off. The first is in uh, the preparatory step. We already talked about that. The second is generated here. The third generated here. And that's all of the three carbons of pyruvic acid. So all of the carbons of pyruvic acid are converted into CO2. And when we're talking about glucose, which has six carbons, it'll generate two pyruvic acids. Each pyruvic acid will go through the preparatory step and the Krebs cycle, meaning for each molecule of glucose, both the preparatory step and the Krebs cycle will run two times. So all of the uh, carbons in glucose are converted into CO2. One here, one there, one there, and then we do this again. So there'll be a second one there, a second one there, and a second one there. And that means all of the carbons in glucose are converted into CO2. That is where we uh, generate the CO2 we breathe out. It is from the preparatory step and the Krebs cycle uh, burning glucose in aerobic respiration. None of the CO2 that we breathe out comes from oxygen. There's something for you to know. And in the uh, Krebs cycle, we also generate ATP, one molecule right down here. Now realize the preparatory step in the Krebs cycle run two times. So the preparatory step generates one ATP and the, uh, the Krebs cycle and the preparatory step generate one ATP, four NADHs, one FADH2, and three CO2. But realize that both of these steps run twice for each molecule of glucose. So to, for each molecule of glucose, we'll get two ATP, eight NADH, two FADH2, and six CO2. The NADH and the FADH2 will carry the electrons to the electron transport chain, the third step 
in aerobic respiration. Any question about any of that? You should know how many ATP are generated per molecule of glucose. You should also know how much NADH and FADH2 are generated from the preparatory step and the Krebs cycle. Any question about any of that? All right. So the NADH from glycolysis and uh, the NADH and the FADH2 from the preparatory step in the Krebs cycle carry the electrons to the third step of aerobic respiration, which is the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain is a series of carrier molecules that are in turn reduced and oxidized as electrons flow from one molecule that the electron initially came from glucose, and then they're passed down the chain. So NADH and FADH2 will carry the electrons to the electron transport chain. And then the electrons are moved from one molecule in the chain of molecules to the next. This will release the energy from the electrons in a highly controlled way. The energy release is used by chemiosmosis, which is part of the electron transport chain, to produce ATP. And I have a little video of that. Let's watch that. The electron transport chain is a series of protein complexes embedded in the mitochondrial membrane. Electrons captured from donor molecules are transferred through these complexes. Coupled with this transfer is the pumping of hydrogen ions. This pumping generates the gradient used by the ATP synthase complex to synthesize ATP. The following complexes are found in the electron transport chain. NADH dehydrogenase, cytochrome BC1, cytochrome oxidase, and the complex that makes ATP, ATP synthase. In addition to these complexes, two mobile carriers are also involved, ubiquinone and cytochrome C. Other key components in this process are NADH and the electrons from it, hydrogen ions, molecular oxygen, water, and ADP and PI, which combine to form ATP. At the start of the electron transport chain, two electrons are passed from NADH into the NADH dehydrogenase complex. Coupled with this transfer is the pumping of one hydrogen ion for each electron. Next, the two electrons are transferred to ubiquinone. Ubiquinone is called a mobile transfer molecule because it moves the electrons to the cytochrome BC1 complex. Each electron is then passed from the cytochrome BC1 complex to cytochrome C. Cytochrome C accepts each electron one at a time. One hydrogen ion is pumped through the complex as each electron is transferred. The next major step occurs in the cytochrome oxidase complex. This step requires four electrons. These four electrons interact with a molecular oxygen molecule and eight hydrogen ions. The four electrons, four of the hydrogen ions, and the molecular oxygen are used to form two water molecules. The other four hydrogen ions are pumped across the membrane. This series of hydrogen pumping steps creates a gradient. The potential energy in this gradient is used by ATP synthase to make ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. The ATP synthesis steps you see here are discussed in greater detail in the ATP synthase gradients animation.
This animation illustrates two full cycles of electron donation. In biological systems, however, many electron transport cycles occur simultaneously, helping to ensure that the proton gradient is always maintained. All right, any questions about that video? I don't think I want that. So let's talk about aerobic respiration, the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain is a chain of proteins in a membrane. Let me blow this up. Where NADH and FADH2 donate the electrons to the chain, and then the electrons move from one protein in the chain to the next. In eukaryotes, these proteins in the membrane is in the inner mitochondrial membrane of the mitochondria. In prokaryotes, this chain of proteins is in the cell membrane. Any questions about any of that? So the electron transport chain in eukaryotes is happening in and across the inner mitochondrial membrane. In prokaryotes, it's happening in and across the cell membrane. In short, the electrons are brought by NADH and FADH2, and then they're dropped in the, uh, or transferred from NADH, which becomes NAD+. Plus. Uh, they're transferred to the first protein in the membrane, and then the electron moves to the third, to the fourth, to the fifth, to the sixth, to the seventh. When the electrons are finished, coming out of the last protein in the chain of proteins in the membrane, the electrons in aerobic respiration flow to oxygen, and that is why we call it aerobic respiration, because the electrons flow to oxygen. The oxygen combines with the electrons and with hydrogen ions, right here, to form water. And this is why we have to breathe oxygen in. All of the oxygen we breathe in is converted to water in aerobic respiration. None of the oxygen we breathe in is converted to CO2. Any question about any of that part? All right. The electrons, when they're moving from, or, or when they're moving through some of the proteins in the membrane, they give that protein the energy the protein needs to pump hydrogen ions from this side of the gradient to that side of the gradient. And that happens with this protein, that protein, and this protein in aerobic respiration. You'll note that NADH is a little more efficient than FADH2 because NADH donates its electrons to the first protein in the chain of proteins in the membrane. FADH2 does not. It gives it to the second or the third protein. And the first protein transports hydrogen from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane. So NADH is a little more efficient than FADH2 at pumping hydrogen ions and generating ATP. I'm not going to explain that yet, but we'll talk about it in a minute. Any question about any of that? All right. As hydrogen ions are decreasing on this side of the membrane, and they're decreasing because, one, hydrogen ions are being pumped from this side to that side, and they're also decreasing because hydrogen ions and electrons and oxygen form water, there will be fewer hydrogen ions on this side of the membrane than on that side of the membrane. That will make a twofold potential energy gradient or a twofold gradient. 
and that is there's more hydrogen on this side than that side. There's also more positive charges on this side than this side. By the laws of diffusion, the hydrogen ion are going to want to move from this side of the membrane to this side of the membrane. The hydrogen ions cannot move through a lipid bipolar membrane unless they go through a transport protein or channel protein. And there happens to be one channel protein right here, which is ATP synthase. When the hydrogen ions move through this protein, they give the protein the energy it needs to phosphorylate ADP and combine ADP and phosphate into ATP. This is how your cell makes ATP. So the making of ATP from glucose happens in many steps of uh, chemical reactions and then at least one physical reaction where the hydrogen ions from this side of the membrane are transferred to that side of the membrane. And then they can move through here uh, to allow this chemical change to happen, ADP plus phosphate equals ATP. So the point is aerobic respiration happens by many chemical reactions and uh, one or two physical reactions. A physical reaction is not where the atoms are changed, like ADP and phosphate are changed into ATP. A physical reaction is where the state is changed, like when you uh, combine milk and cream and sugar, and then you make ice cream out of it. The molecules of milk and cream and sugar are all there. In the ice cream, they're just different because it's a physical change. Any question about any of that? All right, I think I've talked about everything in aerobic respiration. Uh, in the electron transport chain, ATP production kicks into high gear. You get 34 ATP molecules made in the electron transport chain of a prokaryotic cell. And they're a little more efficient than a eukaryotic cell, or I should say most eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotes generate 32 to 34 ATP in the electron transport chain per molecule of glucose. Let me state that your heart your liver and your kidneys are more efficient cells and they generate 34 ATP per molecule of glucose than all the other cells in your body, such as your skin cell, your nose cell, your cells of your bone. They generate 32 ATP molecules per molecule of glucose for the electron transport chain. Why do you think your heart, your liver, and your kidney are more efficient than all your other cells, like your skin cells, your muscle cells? Well, what do you know about your heart cell? And why is the brain less efficient than the heart? This should be apparent because nobody's answering. Your brain is not always working. Your heart is always working. Once it stops working, you're dead. The same is true for your kidneys and your uh, liver. They're always working. So these organs are more efficient and they generate 34 molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. All the other cells in your body are not as efficient and they only generate 32 molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. Any question about any of that? All right, I've already stated the final electron acceptor 
in aerobic respiration is oxygen. Oxygen combines with hydrogen ions and electrons to form water. So all of the oxygen we breathe in is converted into water by anaerobic respiration. Now for humans, we happen to breathe out a lot of that water that we uh, make in aerobic respiration. But for like desert animals, the generation of water in aerobic respiration is critical to their survival. And desert animals like the a desert mouse, I forget what you call those things, but there's a species that lives in the desert. I used to know, but I don't remember. A desert mouse and other desert animals actually generate 60% of their water from aerobic respiration. And so they're very good at recycling that. We can recycle some of it, but we are not as good as a desert animal. I don't know how much we recycle, but it's not 60%. And a desert animal gets actually 60% of the water it needs from aerobic respiration. Any question about any of that? All right, this slide is showing you the steps of aerobic respiration in general, the steps in the electron transport chain, and where the chain is happening. Let me go through each of these. Uh, NADH and FADH2 bring the electrons to the molecules in the electron transport chain. NADH donates its electrons to the first molecule, FADH2 to the second molecule. So FADH2 is not as efficient at generating ATP as NADH. The electrons then flow through all of the molecules in the electron transport chain. You don't need to know any of them. We will talk a little bit in the lab about cytochrome uh, oxidase C. And then the electrons flow from the last protein in the membrane of the electron transport chain. The electrons flow to oxygen. Oxygen is converted into water. I've already stated this. Let me bring it down here. The uh, electron transport chain shown here happens in a eukaryote cell in the inner mitochondrial membrane. This membrane here of the mitochondria. In prokaryotes, which do not have a mitochondria, it happens in the cell membrane. Here's a question for you. The hydrogen ions, which are being pumped from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane, where are the hydrogen ions ending up on this side of the membrane? Where are the hydrogen ions? It's actually shown here. Anybody? What's outside the cell membrane? Make sure I've got people here. Yep, there's 10 people here. Nobody's contributing. Well, think about that. Let me share my screen again. Uh, let's see now. They move outside the cell membrane? Yeah, they move outside the cell membrane, but what's outside the cell membrane? What's right here? It's actually shown right there. The cytoplasm? No, the cytoplasm is inside the cell membrane. Oh. So what's outside the cell membrane? The cell wall? The cell wall, yeah. The hydrogen ions are pumped into the cell wall. And then the hydrogen ions move uh, back into the cell by the ATP synthase, which converts ADP and phosphate into ATP. Uh, I can state that uh, this mechanism for making ATP is actually 40% efficient, meaning that of the energy in glucose, 40% of that energy is converted to the energy in ATP. And you might say, geez, that's less than half. That's not very efficient. But 
Does anybody know how efficient the best engine is that we can make that converts energy and gasoline into energy and motion? Or any engine for that matter. Anybody know? The best? I thought it was like 30%, but I'm not sure. Uh, that's a little high, but you're close. The highest, the absolute highest is like 25%. And that would be like a plastic car that you would not ever drive on the road. Uh, you can convert 25% um, of the energy in gasoline into the energy in motion. Most of our engines, the best efficient that we can get, and this would be like in a normal car, would be 20% uh, of the energy in gasoline is converted into the energy of motion. Okay, so the cell is actually much more efficient, almost twice as efficient as the best engine we can make. So just to show you how efficient the cell is, and yeah, 40% isn't great by our numbers, but for the laws of thermodynamics, 40% is quite good. I've already talked about that. I've talked about that. I've talked about that. I haven't talked about the proton, proton mode of force, and that's just the pumping of hydrogen from one side of the membrane to the other. And I did mention that electron transport chain has a number of different names. One of them is chemiosmosis. Chemiosmosis is the movement of hydrogen ions, and that movement is used to make ATP. Uh, electron transport chain, as I stated, has a couple of different names. It can be called the electron transfer chain instead of the electron transport chain. That doesn't tend to confuse students because that's so similar, but it is also called oxidative phosphorylation. This is a totally different term. I don't use this term. I stick with the electron transport chain. And your textbook tends to call it the electron transport chain. So in aerobic respiration, in counting up the ATP, we generate two ATP in uh, glycolysis. Let me come back here. Maybe I can move forward right there. Two ATP are generated in glycolysis. Two ATP are generated in the Krebs cycle. Sorry, it's not showing you the number. And then 34 to 36 are generated in the electron transport chain. That makes a total of 36 to 38 ATP in eukaryotic cells. Depending on what cell it is, the heart, the liver, and the kidney will generate 38 ATP. All the other cells of your body only generate 36 ATP per molecule of glucose. Prokaryotes are a little more efficient. They generate 38 ATP molecules per molecule of glucose. And remember, the summary reaction for all of these steps in aerobic respiration is glucose C6H12O6 plus six oxygen uh, molecules and 38 ADP and 38 phosphate will be converted into six CO2, six water molecules, and 38 ATP molecules. Any question about any of that? So you do need to know the numbers of ATP that are made in each step of, of aerobic respiration. Uh, that glucose starts the process and it's converted into pyruvic acid in glycolysis. The pyruvic acid is converted into CO2 in the preparatory step and the Krebs cycle. 
And then the electrons uh, are used to make uh, ATP in the electron transport chain for a total of 36 to 38 in a eukaryotic cell and uh, 38 in a prokaryotic cell. Let me blow this up. That's actually shown here. Two ATP in glycolysis, two ATP in the preparatory step in the Krebs cycle, and 34, 32 to 34 in the electron transport chain of a eukaryotic cell. Prokaryotes uh, generate 34 in the electron transport chain for a total of 38 possible ATP. Now remember, most cells of our body, except for the heart, the kidney, and the liver, can only generate 36 ATP per molecule of glucose. All right, any questions about aerobic respiration? If not, let's move on to um, anaerobic respiration. Anaerobic respiration is where respiration occurs, but the final electron acceptor is not a molecule of oxygen. The electrons flow to a molecule other than oxygen. What molecule it is depends on what form of anaerobic respiration it is. It can be an inorganic molecule where the electrons flow to nitrate or nitrite or sulfate or iron. And it just depends on what form of anaerobic respiration the cell is performing. Different cells can perform different forms of anaerobic respiration. Generally, anaerobic respiration does have glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, and they have the electron transport chain, but the electron transport chain is shorter in anaerobic respiration than it is in aerobic respiration. Because the electron transport chain is shorter, anaerobic respiration generates less ATP than aerobic respiration. How much less depends on the form of anaerobic respiration. The very best forms of anaerobic respiration generate 36 molecules of ATP. The worst forms of anaerobic respiration generate a little more than two molecules of ATP. So we'll say that the ATP yield is between two and 36. Therefore, anaerobes generate less ATP per molecule of glucose, and they tend to grow more slowly than aerobes for that reason. And that is an aerobe grows faster because it can generate more ATP per molecule of glucose than the anaerobe. Any question about any of that? If you were actually in a lab and you were growing anaerobes, you'd note that they tend to grow slower than an aerobe. All right. So we've now talked about respiration, both anaerobic and aerobic. Let's talk to firm, turn to fermentation. Fermentation is another way that cells can generate ATP, but it is not a form of anaerobic respiration. And that's really depending on your author. Uh, our author considers fermentation not to be a form of aerobic respiration. I mean, anaerobic respiration. And anaerobic respiration does include uh, glycolysis, the preparatory step, the Krebs cycle, and an electron transport chain. And fermentation does not. Fermentation only has glycolysis and then the fermentation steps after glycolysis. Any question about any of that? Fermentation can release the energy from the oxidation of organic molecules, such as glucose, 
by glycolysis. And then glycolysis uh, proceeds as normally as discussed above, producing two pyruvic acids, a net gain of two ATP, NADH from the glucose. And you can burn other molecules besides glucose and glycolysis. And then you add the fermentation step after glycolysis, where you convert the pyruvic acid generated in glycolysis to the fermentation end product. Usually the fermentation step is only one or two chemical reactions. Fermentation does not require oxygen. It does not use the Krebs cycle or the electron transport chain. It has an organic molecule as the final electron acceptor. So NADH actually gives the electron to pyruvic acid, which will then be changed into the um, final product of fermentation. So this organic molecule is the final electron acceptor of fermentation. Any question about any of that? All right. Here's a question for you. Our muscle cells can engage in fermentation if oxygen is uh, depleted. Our muscles will fall back on fermentation to generate ATP. And why it generates ATP is because uh, there is some ATP made by fermentation. And the muscle needs ATP if the muscle is to work. Without any ATP, the muscle can't work. And I'm sure you've all seen in the Olympic, uh, what do you call it, the Olympic ceremony, whatever it's called. Uh, there's usually one Olympic athlete in each Olympic event where the athlete is like running across the finish line and he uh, runs out of ATP and he just collapses. In the summertime, the coach will run over and dose him with water or spray him with water. In the wintertime, I think the coach runs over and throws a blanket on him. And then he's fine. He just doesn't have any ATP. He used up all his ATP in his muscles. And then the muscles can't work any further. So he collapses because the muscles can't work. They can't contract. And then he gets up. After a little while, because the heart and the lungs are working like mad to try and get oxygen and uh, food and glucose to the muscle cells so that they can, can perform aerobic respiration. And then the Olympic athlete will st stand up in a little bit and then he'll walk across the finish line. I'm sure you've all seen that because usually that happens once in each Olympic event. Uh, like I said, the Olympic athlete was pushing himself to his limit and he used up all his ATP. The heart and the lungs are working like mad to try and get oxygen and food to the muscles, but they can't work fast enough. The muscles are working too hard and the muscles fall back on fermentation. And as long as there's glucose around, the, the, uh, the muscle can perform fermentation and make some ATP and the muscle can continue to work. But once the glucose is gone, then the Olympic athlete just collapses. And I'm sure you've all seen that. <sighs> the uh, lactic acid will be made in our muscle cells and it's not a poison. It will start burning our muscle because it is an acid. But uh, uh, what happens is with time, once we stop working our muscle, that lactic acid will be converted 
back into pyruvic acid, and then we'll go through aerobic respiration in the normal way. Uh, NADH right here is not stored from glycolysis. It is used up in the fermentation reaction right here. And why doesn't the cell store this and then just wait for the, uh, the heart and the lungs to work like mad to bring oxygen and food to the muscle? And then the cell could use this NADH in aerobic respiration to generate more ATP than it would if it were to use it in fermentation. So why does the cell, our muscle cells, not just store this NADH and just wait for the heart and the lungs to bring uh, oxygen and food to the muscle so it can then perform aerobic respiration? If the muscle cell did that, it would generate more ATP, but it doesn't. It uses that NADH up in fermentation. Why? Why is NADH used up in fermentation? It's actually shown right here, guys. If you don't have any NAD+, plus, you cannot have glycolysis happening. If glycolysis does not happen, you cannot generate ATP. So the muscle cells will use up NADH to generate NAD+, plus, and then glycolysis can continue to happen. Without any NAD+, plus, you cannot have glycolysis happening. Without glycolysis happening, you don't have fermentation happening, and you don't generate any ATP. The muscle cell wants to engage in fermentation, so it can generate some ATP, so the muscle can, cell can continue to contract, so the muscle can continue to work. And that's the way our muscles work. They're the only cell in our body which can perform, perform fermentation. All the other cells in our body can only make ATP from aerobic respiration. Any question about any of that? All right. Uh, there are a couple of fermentation reactions. I'm going to require you to know two of them. Lactic acid fermentation and alcohol, alcoholic fermentation. In both reactions, they start with glycolysis. Glycolysis is what produces the ATP. In lactic acid fermentation, you have one further step, which is the fermentation step. The pyruvic acid here is converted into lactic acid here. Our muscle cells can perform lactic acid fermentation. Many other organisms can perform lactic acid fermentation. We actually use lactic acid fermentation to prevent food from spoiling. It's how we make sauerkraut, yogurt, most forms of cheese, like cheddar cheese. Um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, sausage is made this way. Most fermented food is made with lactic acid fermentation. And even chocolate is made this way. Alcoholic fermentation is another fermentation reaction where pyruvic acid is changed in two steps into ethanol. Ethanol is a two carbon molecule. Pyruvic acid is a three carbon molecule. And so one carbon dioxide has to come off in alcoholic fermentation and that generates CO2. This CO2 is actually why Beer has its fizz. CO2 is generated and it stays in the bottle. That's why the bottle is capped. And that gives beer its fizz. And wine, which is another thing we use alcoholic fermentation, a wine is made in an open barrel or casket 
and the CO2 is generated, but it is given off to the air. And so when you open the bottle of wine, it doesn't have CO2 in it. If we were to generate the wine in a bottle and cap the bottle so the CO2 remains in the wine, we could do that, but we don't call it wine. We call that champagne. It's the same thing as wine. It's just that it's fermented in the bottle that's capped. Any question about any of that? A yeast performs alcoholic fermentation. And if you make sourdough bread, which actually is a bad example, you make leavened bread using yeast, it performs alcoholic fermentation. And that gives off the CO2, which gives the bread its, its uh, lighter structure and... Uh, makes the bread leavened, okay? Sourdough bread does have yeast in it that gives off the CO2 and making it uh, leavened, but sourdough also has bacteria in it, which make the acid, which make the bread sour. And it doesn't perform alcoholic fermentation. It usually performs lactic acid fermentation, the, uh, the uh, bacteria in sourdough culture. Uh, many bacteria can perform lactic acid fermentation. If you know any of the bacteria that make yogurt, I used to know them, but I'm afraid I don't remember. Streptococcus lactis, I think, might be one. Uh, many of the bacteria that make yogurt, there's more than one, uh, can perform lactic acid fermentation. There are different fermentation reactions. You don't need to know all of them. Let me see. Yeah, that's good enough. Like I said, you only need to know lactic acid fermentation and alcoholic or ethanolic fermentation. Uh, the yeast is uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. The bacteria, like I said, Streptococcus lactis is one, lactobacillus. And then there's some bacillus species which perform lactic acid fermentation. A cheddar cheese is made this way. There is one cheese which is not using lactic acid fermentation, and that is using proponic acid fermentation, and that is Swiss cheese. Swiss cheese is a different process. Doesn't use lactic acid fermentation. And Swiss cheese gives off CO2 and that's why Swiss cheese has a hole in it. Uh, there are other fermentation reactions like butric acid fermentation, which makes more than just butric acid. It actually makes all of these compounds. And then succinic acid, which makes more than just succinic acid. It makes all of these compounds. And then uh, formic acid, which makes all of these compounds. I think this is the one we use to make uh, vinegar. And this one we use to make many different products. Uh, this one we make to make yeast, bread, and wine. I should say leavened bread here. Uh, this one is uh, almost any other fermented food you can think of, except for Swiss cheese, which is here, and, uh, and alcohol. All right, any questions about fermentation? Uh, this table is just showing you some of the different fermentation end products. Ethanol, lactic acid are the only two you need to know. Uh, cheese, must cheese, yogurt, rye bread, sauerkraut, summer sausage, lactic acid fermentation, beer, wine, leavened bread, ethanol. We do uh, use ethanol in our cars as fuel too. So we got fuel down there. Acetic acid fermentation is used to make vinegar. You don't need to know that one. Oh, there's Swiss cheese there. All right, this is a summary table comparing aerobic respiration 
anaerobic respiratory duration, and fermentation all compared. You should realize the energy that's produced from aerobic respiration is the highest. A prokaryotes generate 38 ATP per molecule of glucose. Anaerobic respiration is not as efficient. It is variable. It's fewer than 38, but more than two. So someplace between above two and 36 for anaerobic respiration. Fermentation only generates two molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. Aerobic respiration has to happen in oxygen, meaning in an air, aerobe. Anaerobic has to happen anaerobically. Fermentation can happen either way, either with air or without air. The final electron acceptor in aerobic respiration is oxygen. In anaerobic respiration, it's usually an inorganic molecule other than oxygen, something other than molecular oxygen. In fermentation, the final electron acceptor is an organic molecule like pyruvic acid. You don't need to know that column. All right, any question about the summary? So we've talked about catabolism and making ATP, especially using aerobic respiration, but we did talk a little bit about anaerobic respiration, and we did talk about fermentation. Apart from glucose, any carbohydrate can be used as a food source for energy to make ATP. Generally, carbohydrates are just broken down into simple sugars, and then the simple sugar is converted into glucose, and then the glucose is sent down aerobic respiration in the normal way. For example, if you were to eat a high starch diet, you just break off the glucose from the starch and then send that down uh, aerobic respiration is glucose. But if you were to eat milk, for example, the lactose sugar will be digested. Uh, that'll mark, make glucose. And then the beta galactose will be converted to glucose. And then glucose is sent down aerobic respiration in the normal way. Microbes may also use lipids and proteins for catabolism to generate ATP. They do have a problem though, and that is large molecules like large lipids and large proteins cannot cross the cell membrane. And that's true for us too. When we eat a high protein diet, that protein is too large to cross the cell membrane. So how does our gut cell digest it? The same way that microbes do and that is they excrete lipases and proteases extracellularly, meaning you secrete these enzymes outside the cell and then digest the cell extracellularly, breaking down the lipids and proteins into the monomers. The glycerol and the fatty acids can then be brought into the cell, across the cell membrane, and then the protein is broken down into the amino acids, and then the amino acids are brought into the cell. It is true you may need a transport protein, like for every amino acid, for it to get into the cell, you have to have a transport protein to pump it across the cell membrane. Yeah, because amino acids will be... Uh, polar, and they're not going to cross the cell membrane. They won't cross the lipid bilayer. Glycerol will be catabolized and by glycolysis, the fatty acids of, of lipid will be cleaved into two carbon molecules, and then those two carbon fragments will enter the Krebs cycle as acetyl coenzyme A. 
of the amino acids, the amino group NH2 has to be removed. And then the remainder of the amino acid will be converted and most of them will enter the Krebs cycle. Any question about any of that? All right, let's look at that in a little more detail. So carbohydrates will just be converted to a simple sugar. The simple sugar will be converted into glucose, and then glucose will be sent through aerobic respiration or anaerobic respiration in the normal way. Lipids will be broken down into glycerol and fatty acids. The glycerol will join um, the Krebs cycle, I mean, excuse me, glycolysis midway through and then go through uh, the um, glycolysis in the normal way. The fatty acids will be broken down into two carbon chunks, converted into acetylcoenzyme A, and then enter the Krebs cycle. And that's how lipids are digested. Proteins will be broken down into amino acids. I guess I should have said that. Well, that, they're broken down into those. That's right. Uh, the amino acids will depend on what the amino acid group is. There are different amino acids. Some of them will be entering glycolysis near the end. Some of them will be converted into acetylcoenzyme A. Some of them will be converted into a molecule which will then enter the Krebs cycle. The point is proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids can be digested by catabolism, and then we can generate ATP from protein digestion, carbohydrate digestion, and lipid digestion, similar as we generated ATP from glucose. All right, I've sort of mentioned this before. The metabolic oxidation of glucose in aerobic respiration is the most efficient at generating ATP. That is the most efficient way that cells can generate ATP. The energy in ATP is used for various cellular processes, including active transport, like if the cell wants to pump something into the cell, it will split ATP, take that energy to transport the molecule into the cell with an active transport protein. But ATP can be used for movement, like the reason why my muscles are moving is because I'm using up ATP. And we can also use ATP for the synthesis of new cellular components. All anabolic reactions take the input of energy and we usually get that energy from ATP, splitting ATP. So most cellular ATP is used for the latter where we make the synthesis of new molecules, including the biosynthesis of lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, and polysaccharides, the four molecules of life. Now I've talked about anabolic and catabolic pathways, like they were separate and distinct pathways. In reality, that is not the truth. That is not the truth. The two pathways have integration. There is an integration of metabolism where anabolic and catabolic pathways have common intermediates. We call them amphibolic pathways, a metabolic pathway that can function in both directions. So it can go this way, and be catabolic, or it can be that way and be uh, anabolic. These amphibolic pathways bridge the pathways involved in carbohydrate, lipid, and protein uh, metabolism. You all know this. If you were to eat 
a high protein diet and you were to eat a lot of protein, you're not going to store that protein down as protein, right? What are you going to store that protein down as? If you eat a lot of protein, you eat too much protein, what are you going to store that down as? You're not going to store it down as protein. Fat. Yeah, you'll store it down as fat. So there is a way for our body to... Oh, shoot, I don't have protein on here. Well, it's sort of right here broken down into amino acids. There is a way to um, break down the protein into the amino acids. And then the amino acids, depending on which amino acid it is, can enter the aerobic respiration. And then most of the pathways are amphibolic. And like, let's say this amino acid here is converted into pyruvic acid. Well, this normally goes this way, but it can go this way as shown here. And we can go all the way up here to form glucose. Okay. If you don't need the glucose, then the amino acid will uh, form this right here. This is showing one way, but in reality, this is connected to there and there. So this is both ways. Meaning this goes this way, but it goes that way. So you can go that way. And it can go this way to make glycerol. And it can go, pyruvic acid can be converted into acetylcoenzyme A. Acetylcoenzyme A can be converted into the two carbon uh, units. And the two carbon units can be converted into fatty acids. The fatty acids can get together with the glycerol to make lipids. And that would happen if you ate too much proteins, it'll be digested, converted into these intermediates, and then converted into lipids. And you'll store it down as fat. That's true if you eat too much carbohydrate. It'll be broken down here, and then converted into fatty acids and glycerol, and then stored as fat. So that's true of anything you eat too much of why you shouldn't eat too much. Of course, if you eat too much lipid, it won't even be broken down, it'll just be stored as fat. Any question about any of that? The point is there's a lot of amphibolic pathways and the Krebs cycle and the, uh, what do you call that? The preparatory step and glycolysis all of these reactions are amphibolic. It is true that we cannot convert CO2 into its preliminary molecule. So we cannot do that. But a green plant could convert CO2 into that molecule or into glucose and then send it this way. And if the green plant wanted to make fat, it can convert it into a lipid. We have a lot of amphibolic pathways and we are not very good at converting one molecule to another. Green plants and photosynthetic bacteria, as well as most microorganisms, are better at converting one molecule to another than we are. But as you can see, all of these pathways in aerobic respiration shown here uh, can be converted into an intermediate and then converted into lipid or protein or carbohydrate. And that is how most of us couch potatoes would uh, burn a protein. You'd convert it into a uh, an amino acid converted into some molecule of aerobic respiration. And then most likely, if we're a couch potato, we're going to convert that back into glucose. And the glucose will be stored down as gly um, glycogen in our liver. And then the glycogen will be released when we need it. 
and it'll be uh, released as glucose and then sent down uh, aerobic respiration the normal way. So that's just showing how a couch potato tends to burn protein. And the same with lipids. They won't burn lipid directly. And like I said, it's actually difficult to burn lipid in a marathon runner. They don't burn lipid directly until 45 minutes into the run. But they can burn lipid. Most of us don't exercise for 45 minutes, so we would never be doing that. At least me, who's a couch potato. I do do some exercising, but uh, very seldom do I ever do strenuous exercise for 45 minutes. Any questions about any of that? So anabolism and catabolism are actually linked, and they are linked by amphibolic pathways. All right, let's briefly talk about, are we out of time? I think we are. Six. Yeah, all right. Uh, I'll continue here. I didn't quite finish uh, lab five or lecture five. Uh, we have just a few more slides, I think two more, but we'll continue here the next time. I will see you at seven Come on, for the lab.